We are here to pay tribute to Mark Golub a year after his death and to remember his extraordinary work. To those of you who didn't know him, Mark was a lover of Jews and Judaism. He delighted in the diversity and the passions of Jewish life. He was a ferocious lover of Israel and defender of the Jewish state. And he was personally a charismatic presence and a joy to be with. And this above all, Mark was a man with a vision. He believed that the American Jewish community needed a network, a 24-7 Jewish cable network, a PBS-style network that would give expression to the treasures of the Jewish world. It would offer news and analysis, but also entertainment and learning and culture. And so he created JBS. The centerpiece of JBS was his interview show, L'Chaim, a show that the three of us, I'm here with Betty Ehrenberg and Steve Baim, had the honor of being on together multiple times. I, I'm almost done, then I'll go to shore. Are you telling me that basically you're not concerned that the Obama administration would take a stand in the UN harmful to Israel? You're not concerned about that? I didn't say that. I said, I said we If you are concerned, we, I want to hear it. Are you concerned? I think it's it's a definite possibility. Somebody at the synagogue called you up and said, Eric, we've got the, a, a question about what we should do with this lovely woman. She's not Jewish, but she's involved in the religious school and she wants to be on the education committee. I mean, I, you're being a journalist here. I mean, look, maybe she... But this is a legitimate question. It this is a legitimate this is real. question, but yes or no. This in other is words, real. Ultimately, Israel has to live in a very precarious situation and do what it can, best yeah. it can. In which case the occupation is a necessary evil. That's, it's a necessary evil. But it, but it remains evil. an occupation. But it's yes. still an occupation. Yeah, it and it's occupation. still evil. But wait, it's Absolutely. evil. But well, we have to fight terrorism on the one hand uh, with all our might, and we have to try to fight for peace with all our might. That sounds correct. However, when one is going on at the same time as the other, when these two things are simultaneous, you don't really have a peace process, and you have people dying because of terrorist attacks. I don't, I don't hear anybody here Nobody. saying they don't favor a two-state solution. Right. What you heard at this table is but there's that not going to be one. That it, right. Probing tough, insistent, and yet civil. That's, a, that's a, a hard mix, and Mark pulled it off week after week because that simply is who he was. Mark was an issues guy, cared deeply and profoundly about the Jewish world. He knew the issues, and he was also, at the same time, a wonderful rabbi and teacher. He was marvelous and extraordinary. Yeah, he's missed. He, really he is, is missed. So let's, let's turn now to some of the things that we would be discussing if Mark were here. And of course, uh, with the, the war ongoing, that it seems to me is where we should start. So um, if, uh, uh, if Mark were here, he would turn to, uh, to Betty or Steve or perhaps to me and say, give me your take on where we're at now. Uh, Steve, why don't we start with you? Well, first of all, again, Mark uh, saw his sense of responsibility to the Jewish world as being a cheerleader for Israel. And in that respect, the ethos of the program, were he here, would be, these are very grim times, but uh, there's a sense of Jewish peoplehood, a sense of optimism. We've survived for millennia, we'll continue. We'll get, we'll get through this. It's going to be a difficult time, let's not minimize it. But yeah, the optimism and faith in Jewish peoplehood was, came through very, very clearly with him. If I turn to my own views, not that I disagree with that at all, but um, my own views, very frankly, have been there's a sense of grimness, that um, Israel finds itself in a, uh, a no-exit situation. Um, there are basically, you know, at least three problems that uh, at this moment in time seem beyond grasp. Um, one is that uh, Hamas is... Uh, demonstrated its capacity to uh, explode some of the myths about Israeli invulnerability, about Israel's capacity to defend itself. It exposed some of the weak links. 
and then when they come back and tell you, we're going to do this a second time, a third time, a fourth time, you can't disregard that. You can't say that's simply bluster. So one major uh, obstacle that right now appears to be uh, very, uh, uh, very threatening to our own sense of self-confidence is precisely that some of the myths of Israel have been laid bare. Um, second uh, is the question about uh, the future of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, President Biden has done a remarkable job in terms of offering support for Israel, almost even at times without even asking for it. As one Israeli commentator put it, he opened up the, uh, the cookie jar without even asking for the key. In other words, he gave Israel what she wanted. Um, how long would that be sustained? Will it last into a, uh, uh, a new administration? The prime minister is talking about a war that will go into 2025. Does the American public want to see that continue? Oh, that American support for Israel. Among the American intellectuals, the university culture, a great deal of revulsion at what Israel has done. Um, it's interesting how this um, somewhat myopic sense of history when the term genocide is invoked. Uh, genocide, aside from the Jewish historical experience with the worst genocide in history, but genocide means you go out intentionally to destroy another people. Um, here, the intention to destroy Israel for reasons of theology, bring about the end of days, that's been on the Hamas side. Um, Israel has created a great deal of damage in counterattacking um, in its incursions in, into the Gaza Strip, but never with the intention of destroy as many people as you possibly can. And thirdly, there's the human question of um, uh, over 100 hostages, I think the number I last heard was 130, who are being held under the most uh, extreme of conditions. Some have died. Um, some have been uh, subject to uh, indignities beyond our imagination. Um, Israeli society, quite rightfully, is clamoring to get those people out. Yet, how are you going to do that? Um, so far, military action has resulted in freeing one captive. Um, uh, in that sense, again, Hamas basically has sort of laid its cards on the table that it stands as a permanent enemy of Israel. Uh, I don't believe Israeli society is prepared to go into another Gilad Shalit affair where um, you know, a, thousand, uh, uh, a thousand prisoners are released in favor in for, uh, for one, one, uh, one captive, one hostage. So again, the problem to me seems right now to be beyond, beyond our reach. Um, do we have faith that we'll rise to the occasion, that things will turn out in the end? The faith has to be sustained, and again, no one did that better than Rabbi Mark Golub. But if you ask me how do I feel right now, my, Eric, I've been in a funk for four months, precisely because I don't see any exit. Um, uh, I was never a great fan of Sartre, nothing else because of his views opposed to Israel, but when he wrote that play, No Exit, he knew something about what he was talking about. Oh, I think, uh, thank you for, so much for these thoughts, I, uh, so many of them uh, going through my mind. You're r absolutely right, Steve, about the, um, the fear of Israel's um, weaknesses being exposed in the sense of uh, um, <clears throat> in the sense of the, the military, the preparedness or ill-preparedness, uh, the feeling that this was not going to be able to happen, this could not happen. And uh, you see it in the people of Israel and the way they express themselves in the social media, on television, and uh, in their fears. Um, I feel, uh, I don't know, I don't feel like there's no exit, truthfully, but I feel absolutely uh, at one with what you said about the grimness. I, th I don't think in, uh, in all the times that we have experienced the Israeli wars in all of our lifetimes, uh, some of them uh, ferocious wars, some of them skirmishes like the past, if uh, Gaza once could have been uh, described as skirmishes, I don't know, that's probably not such a great word. But still, uh, the feeling that we have never been involved, uh, we have never been facing such a time as this, such a tough time as this, uh, is definitely prevalent. I do believe and uh, I think uh, we all have faith. That, that Israel will emerge when. Um, I think a lot depends on how this war is going to be fought in terms of, um, in terms of the public. We worry about these public uh, Im impressions. What will the new administration do? What will the American people want? What will the Jewish people want? What 
uh, uh, do the Israeli people want to put up again with a Gilad Shalit who was held for five years? What, is, what did that mean? And um, I, one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about is uh, going back to the Vietnam War. Um, going from um, the United States having gone from World War II and the Korean War uh, in, in a kind of a co in confidence coming out victorious and uh, with Vietnam ending, ending the disastrous uh, disaster that it was. And my feeling was uh, to go back to that time because one of the big criticisms was the American people did not stomach war anymore because it was the war, Vietnam was the first war fought on television, where every night on the six o'clock news you saw what was happening. There was footage that was not uh, made or filmed during the Korean War. There was footage that was not filmed during World War II. And today we have the, an Israel, Hamas, a uh, war that is every, predicted every minute. It, it goes on, uh, your, your phone pings every second almost with uh, something new that happened in, uh, in Gaza. Something's happened with Hezbollah in the north. Something's happened now with the Houthis. Uh, much like the Six Day War when Israel was fighting so many fronts at once. So that's where I feel the grimness uh, uh, and the um, and the fears are um, coming to bear, and um, and like Mark, I think we have to we have to maintain our faith. Right, it's, you know we've we've talked about his optimism uh, and and his deep and profound devotion to Israel and his belief in the the the, the future of, of Israel uh, uh, as being unshakable. And now, uh, as we've all indicated, we confront certain realities. I mean, Israel set out certain goals here. Uh, it was going to replace Hamas as the ruling power uh, in, uh, in Gaza, and uh, that was, has not happened. It was going to get the, the hostages back, and that has not happened. Yeah, and it was, going to, uh, uh, it was going to return Israelis who live in the, what's called the Gaza envelope to their communities, and that has not happened either. So the three major goals here have not been achieved. That's exceedingly sobering. So if Mark were here, what would he be saying? I'm not sure. He'd be smiling. He'd be reaching a bit. I suspect he'd remind us of, of uh, two things. First of all, he would remind us that after the terrible shock of October 7th, when the Israelis weren't ready, um, the, the people of Israel responded with alacrity, with unity, and with extraordinary bravery. Uh, they have fought well. And uh, with every, every casualty is a tragedy, but um, with relatively few casualties and with the highest morale possible. And this notion that they're united across the political and religious spectrum is really quite extraordinary. Uh, the other thing I think he would be reminding us of uh, is what's happening in, in Israel's civil culture. The fact that the Israeli people, those who are not in the military, have come together in a way that's really quite extraordinary. Um, they have helped those who are weak and those who are need, uh, in need. Um, they have, all those who've made it back from captivity have been overwhelmed with love, admiration, and support. Uh, they have pushed the government to do the things that it must do and to remember the hostages at moments when perhaps they have been uh, forgotten. Uh, those that I know in Israel, again, across the spectrum, they feel it's not going to last forever. But for now, we're together in dealing uh, with this burden. Mark would remind us of that, and he would remind us how that should inspire us uh, about uh, the inner strength of the Israeli uh, uh, people, and he, uh, he, of course, would be right. Well, Erica, basically, I think you're correct on two points, that um, aside from being correct in terms of reconstructing what Mark would have said, but I think you're correct in terms of two of the themes. One thing that has come through over the last four months has been Israeli resilience. And in that respect, the trauma of October 7th was enormous, yet reality is, life does go on, and there is a sense of 
you know, we will get through this. And that resilience is not unknown in Jewish history. If anything, it's been the norm of Jewish history. And yes, we should be, take a lot of pride that it's still the case right now. Second, which I think no one really anticipated, was something you referred to earlier and, and now in your comments as well, is uh, the reaction of Israeli civil society. Um, people willing to volunteer, uh, give of themselves, uh, spend their time uh, on assisting the, uh, uh, the social services of Israel. Um, uh, all that is, again, those are incredibly strong comments about faith of the Jewish people and its ability to come back under these circumstances. But I would probably take issue on two, uh, two other areas. Uh, number one is the issue about uh, unity regarding the war. Um, at the beginning, absolutely. Um, as the goals became increasingly difficult to, uh, to realize, serious divisions are emerging as we speak. Should greater emphasis be placed upon negotiations for the hostages? Uh, there's serious division between the Prime Minister on the one hand and his uh, two, uh, two major supporters, uh, Smutrik and Ben Gavir, an issue in themselves because of their extremism, but basically they're saying that um, uh, no, no further negotiations for hostages. If Hamas wants to release them, great, but no, we're not going to declare a ceasefire in order to have negotiations, which frankly did result in uh, freeing of over 100 hostages, the so-called pause. Uh, so that division about the war, how to conduct it, should one accept the restraints that the Biden administration wants to put on it, or should one defy, defy those restraints? Again, serious division among political leadership, um, with uh, Gantz and um, uh, uh, Eisenkot, and to a lesser extent Lapid standing on, on one side, and Bibi Netanyahu and his uh, uh, his two coalition partners standing on another side. Second, while the war brought about a, uh, almost a kind of um, internal ceasefire on the issue of the judiciary, um, number one, the issue did not go away. And uh, some of the major supporters for the judicial overhaul, um, uh, Levin and um, uh, what's, what was the other man's name? Um, Hoffman. Ho and Hoffman, they're determined to bring it back. Um, so that divisions are quite real. Let's not forget that one of the things that brought this war into being was that Hamas perceived Israeli society as so divided um, by an issue that really had next to no connection with Israeli foreign policy, um, but which one sector of society wanted to radically change, and the other sector of society felt that the judiciary was Israel's main bulwark in terms of uh, shoring up democracy and democratic values. That division is still there. It also carries over into a political division that frankly many people believe that uh, the architects of that judicial reform unnecessarily exposed Israel in terms of exposing vulnerabilities that do not have to be attended to. So in that respect, I agree with your overall, number one, your overall reconstruction of what Mark would have said. And number two, you've point, you pinpointed, I think, two very positive themes in Israeli society. But I also say that the divisions are much deeper and they will be with us for a very long time. And uh, that's resulted in a kind of lock, lack, loss of trust uh, in many aspects of Israeli political leadership. Add to that one other point that I just alluded to is that um, a democratic society um, really cannot allow extremists to go to run haywire, so to speak. It has to control extremism. Every democratic society will have its Ku Klux Klan, if you will. Um, currently, the idea of extremists in the government, I think last time we were here, uh, I guess uh, when the government was being formed, so one, one person who's not here said, there have been extremists before in Israeli, government, in Israeli politics. Absolutely, but this is the first time you've had, it, you've had extremism within the coalition government itself. That's unprecedented. What does that portend in terms of the future? Again, I've got a lot of forebodings about that. Um, it is my fervent hope that things don't go back to exactly the way they were once um, the war is over. Uh, my feeling is that, um, <clears throat> Look, uh, one of the reasons that we saw, you know, those huge demonstrations in the streets of Tel Aviv and the um, blocking the highways and the Ben Gurion Airport and all of that uh, was uh, to hear from the Israelis, we can afford this now. We can afford these uh, divisions. We can afford being able to be so vocal in our disagreements and so vehement in our disagreements 
because we never, we, it, these, these differences always were there, but we never felt we could express them because the issue was our security. We really had to, uh, we didn't discuss it so much because the security uh, concerns were always paramount. And now what we see is that um, they were kind of resting on their laurels in a sense. Uh, and there was a complacency regarding security because of uh, their previous victories, their previous strengths. But now, uh, as you have said, both of you so eloquently, um, the, the, the shock of uh, the ability of Hamas to uh, perpetrate what it did perpetrate on October 7th uh, has shown that, well, maybe uh, we can't rest on our laurels. Maybe Israel cannot just, uh, it, it reminds me, it was, I found it so interesting that this war um, began as uh, one of the most popular films regarding Israel to come out in recent times was the Golda film, which if uh, you saw it, and I think a lot of people did see, uh, uh, laid bare the same kinds of uh, 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 resting on the laurels. Uh, there was Moshe Dayan and others in the cabinet at the time and uh, did not, uh, and the, the intelligence had failed, the, there were failures at the highest levels. So there was ill preparedness. And uh, I think Israel uh, now probably understands due to what happened on October 7th, you can never, ever, ever be um, uh, we can't go back again. Israel cannot go back again to uh, such a feeling of security that we're not yet up to the time of everybody, you know, under its, uh, sitting under peacefully under its vineyard and under its fig tree. So that uh, maybe this feeling of vulnerability that we need to pull together, like you said, Eric, that we need to uh, uh, help each other, like you said, uh, Steve, that we need to give to each other and maybe not go back to the degree. We'll, uh, there always will be differences. I agree with you 100%, Steve, that's who we are, uh, nature of the beast. But uh, to be, go back to the bitterness that was in the debate at that time, I really, really hope that uh, we'll be more on guard. I think uh, the hostage issue is really at the heart uh, of the, uh, the debate right now and of the potential divisions that, that might uh, develop, um, here, here we have this reality. Hamas is a, a, a blood cult. Uh, um, jihadist nihilists, uh, murderers. Uh, they, they not only killed Jews, uh, they Delightful. gleefully put it up on the internet and boasted of it so all, all could see. So Israelis have said, we, we cannot live with the Hamas knife at our neck, and we need to drive them from power. That's a position that I understand, and that I respect, and that I support. Um, at the same time, you have hostages, 130 whatever, and Israel is deeply and profoundly committed because of who they are to get those hostages back. Uh, there are Jewish teachings that you know, emphasize the, the uh, importance of returning hostages. There are also teachings that emphasize in the Talmud about not Limits. overpaying for hostages, so th those sources that exist. But generally speaking, um, um, there, there's great importance that is given in our religious tradition to doing all that possibly can be done to getting those hostages back. Here's the problem. Those two goals uh, are in conflict. Now sometimes the claim is made, well the best way to get them back is to continue with uh, military pressure. I'd like to believe that that's true, but it's not clear that it's true. And uh, you know, if the reality is that Hamas is, is uh, saying there will be a deal that will involve, uh, you'll get your hostages back, uh, but the price is ending the war, at least for now, and leaving us in power, um, and if that's the, the stark alternative that the, the government of Israel faces, what's the answer there? What's the answer? What conceivably can be an outcome under those circumstances that would leave Israel uh, united and, and able 
uh, uh, to continue this this struggle. And I, I, I wonder if Mark were here, and I asked him that question, uh, what he uh, what he might say. But those who pretend that the conflict somehow doesn't exist, I think, are mostly deluding themselves. And in the Israeli press, day after day, you have people on both sides. Uh, those who argue we must continue the battle, and those who say we must get the hostages back. Uh, each makes a case for priority, each is potentially right, and yet we struggle for, for uh, the answer. What I, what I would ask is, um, where is the international outrage? It's all been focused upon actions that Israel has taken in terms of Gaza and the humanitarian crisis there. In the meantime, what Hamas did was they took 240 civilians, um, perhaps there were a few soldiers involved as well, but it was heavily civilians. Some of them were children. Some of them, even, well, I think today's news is that of a one-year-old baby celebrating, in quotes, his very first birthday in, in captivity. Why has the Red Cross not been allowed to visit them? Even if they were prisoners of war, was, even if they were not civilians, by the laws of war that uh, the UN keeps on invoking, the hostages are entitled to Red Cross visitations to ensure humanitarian treatment. That's not taken place. I've yet to see any kind of international outcry. Then, of course, is the issue about, uh, about taking civilian hostages. Again, a direct, um, uh, direct violation of the laws of war. Again, next to no international outcry. The issue about rape. Where, where have been the women's organizations? It came very late when the UN finally held a hearing a couple weeks ago. Where was all this? So I guess my, my point would be, if there is an answer, I agree with you fully that there's a conflict between the two goals. Uh, if there is an answer, perhaps not sufficient pressure has been placed upon the international community about the humanitarian issue, the moral issue, about the treatment of hostages. That may be the, the wedge, if you will, that um, brings about some defense of Israel's position in terms of understanding what Israel's gone through. What I credit the New York Times with, by the way, here is almost every day they run a feature on the testimony of one or another survivor, either someone who was not taken hostage at all or someone who was released. That is kind of news, if you will, that the international community and American society needs to hear, as horrible as it may be in many cases, but at least it shines a light upon the conditions in which these people are, are existing inside Gaza tunnels. That said, um, I, do, uh, I go back to the first point, is the question of the goals that were set out at the beginning of the war of the elimination of Hamas. I'm sorry that word actually was used because it really does set much too high a bar. Uh, the decimation of Hamas. I don't think you can kill an ideology. Uh, you, don't, you, can't, you can't eliminate uh, a movement per se. You may be able to undermine some of its organizational foundations and some of its leadership. But uh, again, let's not delude ourselves into thinking that um, the, that goal of eliminating Hamas remains within Israel's grasp, notwithstanding a lot, of the a lot of the political statements that are made about this war we fought to a conclusion. But what you said solution. about international pressure is so important because it can go a long way in at least delegitimizing them and um, uh, having that pressure that you spoke about being enforced. Uh, it's not even anywhere near. Is that the, uh, their, uh, the application to the International Court of Justice, I mean, let's, let's just talk about irony for a second. Who, who committed October 7th? Who committed the atrocities? Who stole the civilians and the hostages? And, and who committed all those crimes? Well, the International Court of Justice is now judging Israel. Israel is, the, is being accused there. And the application that South Africa made uh, to the International Court of Justice doesn't even mention Hamas, doesn't refer to the atrocities, doesn't say anything about that. So what kind of international uh, pressure are, are we able to be able to summon up and, and, and to exert what you said about the Red Cross? It's appalling. It's, it's more than appalling. How can a, a, an organization that is dedicated to uh, uh, defending human rights, to helping people in wartime, to uh, be, be totally oblivious to, to, uh, and, and to stand cold in, in the face of the request to bring medicines. Now they're talking about that they may bring medicines to the hostages, but they first have to go through Hamas. Well, what, what, what's going to happen to those medicines? Um, where is the international pressure? 
And, uh, and what about public pressure? We talked about the civil aspect of this. When we see hordes of people in world capital, capitals flooding the streets in demonstrations, they call them protests, in, in, in anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist and anti-Israel uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, in numbers of the thousands, this is really uh, something that I think um, we have to think about when we think about Israel feeling alone, uh, adding to the whole seriousness and grimness of this. Yes, it's very important that the United States has been so vocal in its support, and Germany and some other countries. But we are facing now a, a feeling of isolation uh, on the part of Israel and the Jewish people as we wonder, uh, as you said so well, where is the international community? Yeah, I'm. I'm my reaction day, day to day is I'm filled with rage. Yeah. Every day I wake up and I'm, I'm filled with rage. And if Mark were here, I can't help feeling. He would be filled with rage and he would be uh, uh, articulating it. What's happening at The Hague sickens me. Sickens me. I mean, the, the nature of the, ta of the attack, as we said, the, the barbarity of it, the atrocities. We've heard a lot of that. We don't, we don't have to repeat that. The fact that they arrived with tablets in their hands. The, the Hamas terrorists Recording. came with, well, computers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had information as to, to uh, how the villages were laid out, where veterans of the Israeli army lived so that they could be, be targeted. And then we've already talked about the fact they came with cameras in order to, to uh, uh, upload this uh, to the, the internet. Here we're, we're talking about a degree of barbarity. I mean, even the Nazis, for their own reasons, didn't generally record atrocities. And yet, for Hamas, recording atrocities was part of the plan. Um, and yes, uh, so as we, we've all said, in, you know, inter if you want to protest, fine. Uh, but perhaps, why aren't we don't, don't we have more people protesting against Hamas? Why don't we have more people demanding uh, not only the Red Cross should visit, but the hostages need to be returned? Um, the fact that young people on campuses who supposedly speak the language of fairness and equity and justice, that uh, they're, they're directing their anger towards Israel, as opposed to directing it towards Hamas and demanding action from Hamas to put an end uh, to this. So you want to put an end to the conflict, you want to put an end to the killing, there's a way to do it. Hamas puts down its weapons, returns the hostages, and then they could negotiate with Israel, I have no doubt, some kind of plan to uh, um, you know, banish them to some other Arab country. Is that doable? Probably yes. So you want an end to it, that would be the way uh, uh, to, to uh, reach uh, an end to the hostage crisis. But that, that is not what we see. A word on, on humanitarian aid. Um, the United States favors humanitarian aid going into Gaza. I favor humanitarian aid going into Gaza. There's terrible suffering in Gaza. We all recognize that. And uh, uh, we can't harden our hearts in that regard. Having said that, let's point out the double standard. Let us imagine. Um, that a proportional number of Americans have been taken hostage and moved to Mexico, five, which would be five, six, seven thousand people. And let us imagine that in responding, a humanitarian crisis had been created. What American government would permit humanitarian aid to go there in the absence of having the hostages return? Would a Republican government uh, permit that? No. Would a Democratic government permit that? No. Is there any government in the civilized world, France, uh, uh, Germany, uh, Britain, that would permit humanitarian aid to go to an enemy who was holding hostages and refuse to return them? And the answer is, of course not. Of course not. We need to hold Israel to a higher standard for a whole variety of reasons. Nonetheless, uh, it, it must infuriate us uh, that this kind of inhuman conduct continues day uh, after day in the absence of the sort of international response that you've both been talking about.
Um, one footnote, Eric, which uh, you alluded to in these, in these comments. Um, I was not surprised by um, the dissent about the war on campuses. One thing that's well known, campuses tend to be a, a more anti-war culture that goes back to Vietnam. And frankly, the universities played a very constructive role in bringing the Vietnam War to a conclusion. But I wasn't surprised by the fact that uh, Israel, having been attacked, would counterattack. Um, that there be protests because, number one, people have short memories, and number two, there's also no question that, as you mentioned, the, uh, the situation in Gaza, you know, given the Israeli attack, became horrendous. What did surprise me, disturb me, outrage me, was not the dissent so much as the vitriol accompanying it. In other words, you, what you saw in, in, in effect, which you didn't see in Vietnam, was the demonization um, uh, of, of Israel as defending herself. Um, in that sense, um, I have strong views about what's, what universities are doing in general in terms of their, their education as a whole, which perhaps we can discuss some other time. But um, for years, I also thought uh, the university was the institution in American society that was most welcoming of Jewish participation. Uh, for decades, there was never a, a Jewish president of an Ivy League college. By the year 2000, every Ivy League university had at least one, if not two, you know, Jewish presidents. So the doors were open. Jews found themselves very much at home. Very hard to say yourself you're at home when you have tearing down of posters, if you will, of you know, putting up the hostages and university students turn them down, you know, tear them down. Very hard to feel at home when you're accused of being a genocidal. Um, and then the failure of university administrations, especially elite university administrations, to uh, offer that kind of protection and support uh, for Jewish students, even, especially in an age of diversity, equity, inclusion, where theoretically they have an obligation to all, of, all the members of its constituency, uh, including the Jews. Suddenly that seems to have gone by the board. So I've got a lot of concerns in terms of the future going forward um, as to where America is going in terms of the position of Jews. And this war, I think, has brought to light some of the real difficulties that we have, some of us have ignored, if you will, or downplayed. Uh, in, in previous decades. You're too kind, in other oh, okay. words. All right. My view is, you not only see everything that you've mentioned, you see students on campus applauding yes, exactly. the actions of Hamas. Right. And screaming applauding into Fada. the yeah. slaughter <laughs> of Jewish children and the rape of Jewish women. That just exceeds anything we would have imagined conceivable uh, you know, Abs even, absolutely, you know, within, yeah. within the last year or two, and, and just defies any attempt to, to understand what is, is, uh, uh, is motivating them. So um, I would add one thing. The personal threat that I feel as Jews um, when people yell, globalize the intifada, what does that mean? What does that mean? We know what that means. Well, I doubt that they all know what intifada means. Um, um, the, uh, the more, I think the, the more evident expression of that is from the river, Palestine be free from the river to the sea. Frankly, there's very little knowledge of the river, very little knowledge yeah. of the sea. They don't know which river and they don't know which sea. Exactly. <laughs> um, the language is perceived as genocidal, if you will. In other words, it's perceived as these, these students have entered into a world in which um, get rid of Jews. I'm not convinced of that. I think there's a great deal of ignorance, especially about the Middle East. And in that sense, when I say, what are universities teaching today? Education has often become a form of sloganeering rather than reading important books, analyzing them, discussing them, realizing that the world is not black and white. There's a lot of gray. And instead of studying the grayness, we're encouraging students, pick up what you regard as being white and plaster all over the world. But I just feel that uh, world jury now has to have its antenna out, because when you say globalize, you're talking not only the Middle East, you're talking something else. And this is uh, something that I've been thinking about lately a lot. Well, the, the, the anti-Semitism, uh, the anti-Jewish uh, uh, sentiment that we see is an interesting and important question. Um, my own view is it, it divides into two parts. Uh, in Europe and throughout much of the world, um, it's blatant, it's frightening, uh, it's direct, it's open, uh, and you have world Jewish communities who are saying, we need to leave. Or they're having the debate, is this the moment? that we need to leave, to go to Israel, to go elsewhere, because we're no longer safe here. In the United States, I think it's a more complicated question. 
for all that we're talking about, as horrified as we all are at what we see, and given what's happening on the, on the campus, does the average Jew here feel threatened? Uh, is it, is it uh, a personal matter for them, or is it a, a, a news item that they're reading in, in, the, in the papers? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Uh, in my own experience, American Jews are deeply concerned on the one hand. On the other hand, if you push a little bit and you ask, have you experienced anything yourself, um, you know, have, have you or family members or, or children um, uh, felt threatened in any direct way, you, you, you don't always get an answer suggesting that that's what's happening. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you see that. Well, first of all, one, uh, one historical footnote. 1973, you heard a great many reports of bumper stickers, oil boycott, burn Jews. Not oil. Not oil. I remember that. Reality is, I heard it so many times, there was no evidence ever presented that it actually was, that actually occurred. Maybe there were a couple bumper stickers, but reality is, is that an image was created that American society was turning against Israel on the oil boycott, when on the ground the reality was much more positive, that people said, what is the oil boycott? You know, they charge exorbitant prices, then, the, then they don't allow us to even buy them at the exorbitant prices. And it was a not result in anti-Jewish backlash. So number one, yes, we're resilient people. At times we often uh, uh, exaggerate our own fears. You know, even paranoids do have enemies, absolutely. But at times we, exa we exaggerate. In terms of where America is today, you know, that was 1973. In terms of where it is today, look, there's been a spike in anti-Semitism, certainly since 2000. In the year 1999, 2000, Commentary Magazine, hardly uh, known to be soft on anti-Jewish threats, they pronounced anti-Semitism to be a relic from the past, a matter of nostalgia. It was gone. That was 1999, 2000. Um, today you'd be, you know, I'm sure Commentary would agree with me on this, is that you'd be naive, you know, to think that anti-Semitism has receded much as it did receive between 1945 and 2000. Now, there's been a spike, and we need to be concerned about it, and the spike has numerous expressions, including anti-Semitism on the right, anti-Semitism on the left, and the entire question of jihadism, which is de facto anti-Semitic. That said, um, I, I think two, uh, I, may, I would make two conclusions here. Um, number one is that American Jews are deeply integrated into American society. Um, and in that respect, support for Israel among Americans generally remains very high. On the college campus, in the intellectual community, or you know, in the journalism, there's a great deal of reason for concern. But in terms of American society as a whole, the Jews do continue to, to occupy a very enviable position. Uh, we've had discussions in this, uh, uh, around this table about mixed marriage, which obviously I don't, I don't favor. But I say one of the side benefits or side effects of mixed marriage is that it does demonstrate how willing American society is to embrace Jews, uh, with other complications that arouse from that. Second conclusion is that um, uh, there are large sectors of the Jewish world, including important, very important sectors, um, who are so visibly Jewish that they really do di experience direct threat. What I mean, obviously, is the Hasidic community, for example. They, they, they can't change their garb, nor should they. It's a free society. They can dress any way they want. Um, yet their garb identifies them as Jews, places them in a vulnerable position. The reports we've heard of about Orthodox Jews being attacked literally without rhyme or reason, uh, but simply they're visibly Jewish. So I, I look at this personally and I say that, um, uh, look, I live in a very comfortable Jewish world of Riverdale, New York. Um, I have not changed my behavior in any shape, manner, or form because I do feel comfortable uh, as a modern Orthodox Jew, actually. Uh, but I'm not nearly as visible, if you will, as some of my, uh, some of my, my, some of my religious counterparts. In that respect, statements that you can't wear a kippah on campus because you'll arouse opposition to it, again, I'm deeply disturbed by that. Are those existential threats? For those who are so visibly Jewish, they very well may, may end up in violence, in attacks, synagogues. You know, in Europe, there's always been security around synagogues. In America, we, bar we barely have known that. But today, we'd be silly not to step up our security because the synagogue is a very visible Jewish institution. So I'd say, yeah, there's reasons for concern, even if it's a far cry from what's happened elsewhere in the world. 
and number two, that American Jews do enjoy a great deal of uh, support from the broader society. So maybe with that, keeping in mind what Mark would say to us, uh, he would pick up on, on your comments. Uh, I, think I think he, he would challenge them, but that's another matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mark, when it came to anti-Semitism, was not an alarmist. Okay. Again and again. And I, generally speaking, was the one who agreed with him, uh, while others around the table uh, tended, to take, uh, tended to take issue. Uh, he felt there was reason for optimism, you know, dealing with the, the issues in this country. Not that, that we should brush anything aside, but, uh, you know, his, his thrust, I always thought, was recognize the dangers, get organized, fight back, we can win. And um, he, he was uh, uh, assertive, uh, had a vision, believed in the American Jewish community, uh, and was confident about what, what uh, we, we could uh, accomplish. Uh, we're thankful to him for that, as we are thankful to him for all that, that he did, we remember his pioneering vision. We remember his accomplishments in the area of media. Um, and uh, we, as, as we look ahead, we are going to build on the foundation uh, that he has created for us. Mm -hmm.